This episode of Game Master's Journey is brought to you by my patrons, readers, and listeners. If you'd like to learn how to support this podcast, visit LikeStarWalker.com slash support. Star Walker Studios presents Game Master's Journey, your multidimensional RPG podcast. Hello, fellow gamer. Welcome to episode 292 of Game Master's Journey. I'm your host, Lex Starwalker. On this show, we discuss the craft and the art of game mastering. I've been running RPGs for over 30 years now, and I produce this show in the hopes that you can benefit from my experience, my triumphs, and my mistakes. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. Welcome to Game Master's Journey. So glad you joined me today. Craig is going to be on here again with me today, and we're going to continue our discussion of his Mage Chronicle that uh, we're all having a lot of fun with. And we'll talk more about the open-ended magic system of Mage and how, to a large degree, the, the biggest limitation uh, in that magic system is the player's own imaginations. And we're going to talk a little bit about Pathfinder's adventure paths and how vignettes and preludes can really add some depth to your tabletop RPG experience and also give you something to do when when all the players can't make it. So yeah, that's some of the, the stuff we, we're going to hit on today. And uh, this is the second part of my discussion with Craig. The first part was episode 291. So uh, if you haven't heard that one yet, you might want to check that one out too. And yeah, uh, we got some stuff to talk about. So without further ado, uh, I'll bring Craig on the horn and let's talk about some mage. I'm curious about Pathfinder 2 because I um, I enjoyed the original Pathfinder and I definitely thought I liked it better than 3.5 D&D. Um, mm-hmm. so, so yeah, I'm curious to see what they did with their second edition. And I, I think the, the rule set works really well for me, but what Paizo, the guys who make Pathfinder, do very, very well that Wizards of the Coast have struggled with a lot is their, like, pre-written adventures yes their, their adventure, adventure paths, paths are awesome are very <laughs> very well done and you know we'll go back to uh the avernus thing that was that, that required a lot of work on your behalf in order yeah. to make that play yeah and, and, and you find a lot of these sorts of things with the uh with withers of the coast stuff so, so. Are, are they doing adventure paths for pathfinder 2 oh yeah they release uh i think there's I don't know, 10 of them that have been released since the game came out. Holy crap. Yeah, they release a, like, they release one every month, like a section of one every month, and have done so for years. Wow. Yeah. So they, they release, like, two, at at minimum, two, one to 20 campaigns every year. You know, it's funny when I um, stopped playing Pathfinder, one of the reasons was I didn't like, having to use the grid and I like doing more theater of the mind, but ironically um, almost all of the fifth edition D and D I've run has been online where you might as well use the grid. It actually yep. makes things easier, uh, especially when you're doing like actual play, it makes it more entertaining for the people watching. So it's like, wow, if, if you're going to be playing online and you're going to be using the grid anyway, you know, might as well try Pathfinder. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Well, and actually, that bring it back to Mage. That was our first big combat that we had. Like the first combat that we had, which was in a park, and it was just an open space, and so it didn't really matter. But yeah, um, the the combat that we had last session was like in this cabin in the woods, and uh, like I've played so much that has had grid that I'm trying to force myself out of that to do more descriptive theater of the mind things because you end up. Like the grid does a lot of things for you, but it also kind of makes you lazy because you don't need to describe what's on the map. You can right. just say, and here's a map. Yeah. See all the things on the map? Yeah. Those are the things that are there. And so this, you needed to, you know, do a bit more uh, desc- description and everything. And um, 
you know, Brett started doodling in order to, in order to make, yeah. he made his own map, right? He's like, they just, cause that's sort of how, yeah, how, how his, a lot of our brains are sort of almost trained to work at this point. And Brett's like that. I've, I've seen that cause I played with Brett a lot. He, he wants a map and, and if yeah. you don't give him one, he'll make his own. <laughs> yeah, which is fine. Which is fine. And uh and, and from my point of view, I think it works well. If I can get the map, if I can describe it and he writes <laughs> he, he draws the map and it's kind of close, I think that that's a good sort of litmus test of whether I've described it okay or not. Well, you know, original D&D that was part of the game. The the it GM was. did not give you a map. The GM described the dungeon and the players drew their own map and if there were mistakes, then fun would ensue and that was part of the game. <laughs> have you ever played that way i have not not as a player no i tried once i tried once as i was i was like you know what that's kind of an interesting thing let's try this yeah and we made it about three sessions and their map was so wrong it was like a it was uh i was doing uh the the mad mage like mega dungeon yeah campaign. yeah yeah under mountain and their map was so wrong it, it, it became much more work for me because they had yeah. they had their map and then they I had the actual true map right and like they would be saying like I go left and it's like well there's no left <laughs> like they, yeah they had drawn the map wrong and it's like there's no left and it's like well of course there's no left because they're if the actual characters were standing in a the hallway they wouldn't turn left and run into a wall that doesn't make any sense you'd see yeah. it's there right so yeah I, I i thought this moment of well that sounds interesting on paper but the moment you actually start writing it down or playing it it, it collapsed pretty quickly well i think part of it may be that back then you know that was before the internet yeah. and so people had better attention spans than we <laughs> we do today. Possible. So, so the players are probably a little bit better at listening to the details and you know where now it's like half your players are off watching cat videos on YouTube while you're describing what the dungeon looks like and <laughs> <laughs> yeah I will say that's the one thing I do like about in person. Yeah. I take away people's phones. <laughs> yeah, you know if they're paying attention better. Yeah. So so, yeah, I tell you what, you've got me really curious about Pathfinder now, especially now that I know they're doing the adventure paths. Because when it comes to D&D and, and similar games, like I really prefer running pre-made adventures these days just because it's easier um, to prep. But I found that's not the case with the, the 5e adventures. I, I Honestly, I don't think they're any easier than coming up with my own because I have to all but rewrite them. <laughs> Yep. So at that point, it's like, how is this helping me? <laughs> I'm I'm putting so much work into making this thing playable for my group. Like, is it really saving me any time than if I just come up with something on my own? One of the things that I... Probably why I have never written a book, well, other than the fact that my writing's terrible, but um, is that like that instigating event, like yeah. I have a difficult time with that. Once I sort of, once the ball starts rolling, I tend to be able to go with it. Yeah. But that sort of like instigating event that feels interesting and feels unique and feels and, and grabs somebody, I have a real tough time with. And I find that pretty much every uh, like adventure path or pre-written adventure or everything at least has that. Yeah. Right. Like even the ones that are kind of brutal and you end up having to write and change and build your own there's a framework there that you can sort of play in. Yeah. Um, which, which has helped me, but I will absolutely agree with you. If you think that picking up a like pre rented a pre-written adventure is going to save you time. <laughs> um, that is you, you were, you were purchasing that product for the wrong reason. Yeah. Um, and even the Paizo ones, I think the Paizo ones are a little easier to run as written. Um, for sure. Um, they're, uh, you know, Paizo, that's what they used to do before they started Pathfinder. They used to be the people who were write, like writing Dungeon ma uh, Magazine. And yeah, yeah. These four, the reason they created Pathfinder was because they lost the license to do it with Lizards of the Coast. So they went and said, well, I guess we'll do it ourselves then. Yeah. Um, so they have a long history of doing it. And so they're pretty good at it. But it still requires work. Like you still have to oh, go yeah. through and read all of it. The other thing is, is you need to figure out where things connect. Because if you're too reliant on the adventure, you can't 
if the players zig when you think they were going to zag and they move someplace else, you need to understand how to get them, how that's going to impact future events. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's requiring a lot of stuff in your head. If you create your own thing, if they, they, they zig, you zag, fine. You just plunk and move something over there and you can keep going and the players would never know, right? So, so I got to ask, have you looked at their adventure paths, the new ones? Yeah, or, I'm running one. Okay. Are they at least laid out better than the D&D adventures? Yeah. yeah. I, I kind of figured. Because, yeah, the yeah. D&D ones, they, it's like reading a novel. You know, it's like if you're going to sit in your chair and like read the adventure, it's it's great for that. But if you actually want to run it, forget it. <laughs> no, they they are very much built for a GM to be able to run it. They're good. good. Scene by scene, scenario by scenario, they end up having like, um, you know, every sec chapters have like major events that are going to happen. What to get across the things that need to happen in this scene in the upcoming chapter and how it connects with different things so they do a they do a good job of that for sure um but uh yeah because yeah I, I ran or ran parts of a couple of them with the original pathfinder i know one of them was kingmaker mm -hmm. and i don't remember what the other one was called but it was kind of it reminded me of ravenloft it was kind of a gothic horror okay. kind of thing. I, I don't remember what it's called, but I, but I don't remember having the problems with that that I do with the 5e adventures where at the table you can never find anything because it's in all these just paragraphs. That, you know. Yeah, I think I think you might have hit it on the head in that I don't think that the I don't think the expectation of um of Wizards of the Coast is that people actually run their stories like their pre-written adventures as written yeah i think they're supposed to be like a combination of their world building um and their sort of because all of them have a like mechanical th parts that sort of end up adding into the games as well so yeah. they end up with like small they're, they're kind of like i don't know a way for them to s charge you 50 dollars for <laughs> 10 pages worth of rules like yeah. But like that's sort of doing them a disservice. But I think the expectation of them is that people sort of a GM sits down and reads them and then pulls and picks from it what they're wanting yeah. or inspired by it to do something their own. Because, yeah, they don't. To, if you were just to sit down and run it, that would be tough. <laughs> but But even if, you know, you are the GM that's just going to pick and pull from it. It even that would be a lot easier if you were dealing with bullet points and lists and tables and things like that instead of just paragraphs and paragraphs of, yes. of prose. So um, I, I would agree with that. I, yeah. I don't know who first said this, but but I heard someone at some point say that they thought that these adventures were made to be read, and that's it. And <laughs> I kind of agree with that, um, just the way they're formatted. Um, yeah. I mean, I go through them with a highlighter and a pen and writing and mart and, and everything just to, to try to make it work. But yeah, rough. they're tough. Yeah, they're tough. Well, I'm going yeah. to have to check out one of those Pathfinder uh, adventure paths. One of the new I, ones. I enjoy them. The one I'm running right now, everybody plays. You're a, like a circus. So everybody plays as like members of a circus, which is a wonderful like instigating event or like scenario because yeah like circus are freaks anyways so yeah like everybody has an idea of what they can do i have you know a guy playing a murderous clown straight out of it i have nice. uh my wizard is a mime and they literally mime their spells <laughs> <laughs> so like if you do like you know wall of force or whatever is you know they yeah. wall they, they mime a wall <laughs> and then it actually happens that's like, funny it's silly, but yeah, it's funny. Yeah, I remember that with their original Adventure Pass, that each one had a very distinct theme mm -hmm. to it. Like they had one that was, you were pirates, and they had one, you know, the Kingmaker one was, you know, you get to run a kingdom and have a castle. And, and yeah. they were really good about that. You could, I mean, I always just pick the adventures based on the theme. Like mm -hmm. th there was one that was, that I was going to run. I can't remember what it's called, but it was, it had to do with like, fairies and stuff and 
Yeah, like if I think about that versus um what was the the Feywilds one that Oh, I don't the, Yeah, I didn't actually look at that one, but I don't remember what it was called. But yeah, it was one of the more remember. recent ones. It was one of the more recent was the coast ones and it was like yeah, there was a lot of people that I remember when it came out because it, there was a one that came there was a there was a Pathfinder one. I oh, know actually it was their Wizard School one. That's the one because there was a Wizard School the one that came out of uh, Paizo almost the same time as one came out for uh, Wizards of the Coast. And like these take a ton of time to write. So obviously yeah. they didn't, that wasn't the plan. It just happened that worked out that that they released within a few months of each other. And it was just like the different ways and different approaches that those two adventures went from two different mindsets that was kind yeah. of interesting because it was very much a lot of people were talking about the ones from Wizards of the Coast was this concept of there's these sort of four parts of the book that don't really connect together and there's a whole bunch of downtime but they don't really explain what to do with it and the scenarios don't really make a whole lot of sense yeah and then the one from paizo was like much it was it was yeah it's set in a wizard school but i think it was a little bit more traditional a little more more laid out in a way that people went oh okay yeah we yeah. know how to do that and i don't know if this is relevant but the uh the wizards one that wizard school that's actually based on a magic the gathering set that they did called strixhaven Right. So it was like a crossover, you know, right. they've done these crossover from magic to D and D stuff. Sure. So I don't, I don't know if that really matters, but <laughs> that's yeah, where I that came from. You can do from. anything with any setting. Like, and it's not like magic. The gathering is lacking source material. Right. Right. <laughs> well, and they're, they're, that's wizards too. So, so they, yeah, well, exactly. they do both. So it's yeah. easy for them from what to I do understand, that. Yeah. From what I understand, the reason why, Wizards of the Coast exists is because of Magic the Gathering. Yes. It's like yeah. a massive portion of their revenue. Well, and yeah, and, and that's what, what the, originally what they did was they, they did Magic and then they branched out. Yeah. Bought TSR and all that good stuff. Well, you've got me curious about Pathfinder now. Well, um, I'll run a, we'll, we'll run a beginner box game for you one day. <laughs> that'd be fun. We'll go from there. At the very least, look, uh, so, so well, on one side, all the Paizo rules are free, which is handy. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Release them online. And the only thing they really, like, they sell books and stuff, but it's all free, which is great. And then you can also, yeah, download, look at some of their adventure paths and just see if they, it, it might be worthwhile just simply looking at them to sort of contrast and yeah compare between what's, you know, what's, what's happening there. And I, I'm sure there's people who have preferences on both sides. Yeah. Well, I, I know one thing I really loved about the original Pathfinder was just how much you could customize your character, which we, we see some of that now in fifth edition. They've, they've pulled in a little bit of that, but um, it's, it's basically any, anything that you got from like your race, for instance, like if you were a wood elf, like any of the traits that you got as a wood elf, you could swap out for something else that was still a wood elf thing, but was different, you know, like, like, uh, you know, elves traditionally get the ability to use like a long sword and a long bow, but you know, you might like, like, I remember I made a pathfinder wizard where I'm like, I'm never going to use those. And I was able to trade those in for like another cantrip or something. I don't remember what it was, but it was so cool. Cause you like literally any aspect of your character, there are multiple options to choose from. So it, even though it was still class based, it felt a little less cookie cutter. Like every elf fighter wasn't necessarily exactly the same, and that was really cool. Well, then Pathfinder Two does the same thing, if not to a higher degree in some ways, of allowing you to really build out your characters. Like what you get as a character by stock is, for the most part, like really boring mechanical things, and then it, and then you get like a bunch of feats. You're gonna get, I don't know, you get a, you get usually several feats at every level. Um, and each of those have a list of options that you can choose from between skill feats and ancestry feats and uh, class feats that give you all sorts of options. And then there's even a really easy way to sort of multi-class by taking in what are called archetypes. And so you can say, well, I'm going to take a little bit of this and we'll add it in. And that allows you to sort of build out your character even more. Um, you know, cool. I have my one character who I was talking about earlier, my investigator who plays the dandy uh, <laughs> archetype. And the dandy is basically just a socialite. And nice. so um, his ability, his top level ability, which he got at like level eight, because archetypes are like, they're smaller, is he can get an invite to any party. Nice. And so 
by social whatever he can just figure out a way to get an invite to any party that's happening that's awesome. which is hilarious <laughs> <laughs> you know and it doesn't take away from his combat it doesn't take away from his ability to do anything else because it's just another part that's added on to the character so he's still as good at doing all his, all the rest he's doing he just also gets to go to a party which means that by the way when you're talking about the fighter who doesn't get to do anything in 5e other than swing a sword yeah in this circumstance they could absolutely become uh, a dandy and get to go to parties and have this entire social aspect that exists in their character yeah. and still swing their sword just as good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. And I, I, I mean, I guess now that I think about it, you could do that to some degree in 5e with the background yeah. that you took. So if you're playing yep. a fighter, you could take a background that maybe gives you some kind of social ability or something. Mm -hmm. um, All of these games can do it. Right? Yeah. Like, um, it's just the toolbox. What what's the toolbox do you have? No, the thing that Pathfinder does is you have to invest more time in it. Like, um, you're like leveling up your character isn't you have to make choices. Yeah. And if you don't want to make those choices, if you want to something that's just sort of more on rails, you're gonna have a tougher time. You can like definitely go online and find a class guide and just choose those and move on. That wouldn't be a problem. But you know, you're sort of missing out on some of the uniqueness of your character and uniqueness of the system well um bringing it back to mage uh you know one thing that that i find really cool is we have what we have four players i think and i mean we're all playing mages but our characters are so different and the mm -hmm. magic that we do is so different and it's not even just the spheres that we have but i, I guess they call it your paradigm so like my character is like a computer hacker, like really into technology. So everything I'm doing is, you know, I'm using my smartphone and my laptop and all this stuff. And, and then Brett's character um, leans really into like Native American shamanism. And, and so, you know, everything he does has kind of that flavor to it. And then Russell's character is like a, former government agent or something who's yeah, like Jason Bourne. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Totally different. And I'm trying to think what are the other characters and then Rose's character is more of a, like an athlete and, yeah. and doing more kind of enhancing um, her characters, like kind of physical abilities with magic. And right. it, it almost seems like each of our characters could almost be like a mage from a different game you know, or even a different time or a different culture. Um, and they're all so different. And yet we're all using the same system. It, it's just, it's really interesting. It's really cool. I am that it allows you to do. And I think that's really what like mage is really, I'm really impressed with is the ability or the, the way that it enables player creativity. Yeah. Right. Like it allows our player, my players to, you know, explore and flex and they don't, I very rarely have to say no. I very rarely like, it feels like it's sort of a yes. And is yeah. sort of built into the game in many ways. You know, the things that they want you to do is just spend, spend time understanding how your character interacts with the world and how your character interacts with the s different systems and, and why let not in more than how, why they do that. Yeah. Right. And, you know, nobody asks why a fighter is good with a sword. <laughs> they just are, yeah. right? Like, it's very rare that that sort of ends up happening. And you can throw in your backgrounds and stuff like that, but it's just assumed you are. Where built into Mage is this concept of, you know, what was your, you know, what was your awakening? What was that event that you went from being asleep to awakening and finding out you were a mage? Yeah. Right? And, like, that's a big event and it's a big thing and it's important for all the characters to understand that sort of traumatic event it sort of feels like i don't know the typical like origin stories from like x-men comics where everybody has this like tragic moment that they had yeah. at some point when they were a teenager that like everybody's an orphan <laughs> oh okay well there's that too um <laughs> but but everybody always has this like event when their powers first show up right and right it you know, cause this big thing. And um, Mage sort of feels like it has that involved in it, which is kind of fun. 
So yeah, I don't know. I'm enjoying it. I I think you know if you're someone who you just like magic and and you want to try like the quote ultimate magic game, I feel like this is it. And I've always felt like this ever since I first discovered Mage years ago. You know, more more as a player. You know, but if you're someone wanting to play like some kind of magic user where really the the main limits are your own imagination of what you can do, like like this is that that game. Well, and what I also kind of liked about it is this concept of, you know, magic has different expressions. And so, you know, is Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon like the like wire foo fighting that yeah, exists yeah. in there is absolutely magic. Like there's yeah. just no way that that's not magic, right? Right. right. Yeah. And so, um, and this game has that entire thing built in. Like if you want to yeah. be a, you know, Kung Fu, you know, wire fighter master and you want to justify it, you get to justify that through magic, right? You don't have to be, you can run through the treetops <laughs> yeah, running through the bamboo. Right. And, uh, you know, so that's the difference between it's it's your expression of that magic and how you want to do it, which is interesting. You don't not, not every wizard is, you know, Gandalf. Yeah. Um, right. You can be you can express that through combat. You can express it like your character does through, you know, hacking, hacking the digital web. Yeah. Right. And so it's kind of fun from that point of view. Yeah, and it's really interesting when you have such very different characters. You know, you can have the one mage who's doing blood sacrifices and and Aya Newt and all that crap, and then you got the other one who's got the VR goggles on and you know, and everything in yeah. between. And and they're right. all in the same reality doing they're their all, things. Well, they might be in different realities that are well, sides yeah. of each other. Because <laughs> there's that entire thing too, of course. <laughs> but um they're all they're all playing in the same space, which is fun. I do wonder how the World of Darkness games actually, from what I understand, the like they don't play particularly well with each other. Like if you wanted to have a a party that was like a werewolf, a vampire, and a mage go into a bar, that yeah. would be, from what I understand, that would be tough to play out. So yeah, that actually goes into what I was going to ask you after we were done about the game. But now I'm thinking maybe I should have it on the podcast because it might be interesting to people. Sure. Um, you can always edit. Yeah. So yeah, um, that's kind of a can of worms um, a little bit. I, I remember people debating this stuff back years and years ago. So for people that don't know, the World of Darkness, there are a bunch of different games and they're all, you play a different kind of supernatural. So there's vampire, there's mage, there's werewolf, there's changeling, which are basically fairies. Um, there's wraith, which are like ghosts. And and those those were the big ones. I had some other like smaller game lines like Mummy. <laughs> and and they had one called um I think it was called Hunters or something, where you just played normal humans that like hunted vampires or whatever. Um it felt like it was a supernatural. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Um mm-hmm. so they all use the same system, but but they're famously not balanced with one another. For instance, like as far as physically, the werewolves are just like way above everything. So, you know, you can make a beginning werewolf character and a v- beginning vampire character. And if they got in a fight, the vampire wouldn't have a prayer. The werewolf would just tear them. And, and really, a werewolf would tear up anything, a, a character from any game, no problem. The, I think actually, and this is kind of interesting, I think Mage, you start out the weakest because I'm, most most of the most beginning vampires I, I can think of would not have any trouble killing a beginning mage character, and part no, of that you're just a human. Like yeah, you you're literally just have human. the same like stat yeah. line as a human, except yeah. you've got like you can hopefully do some magic. Well, and that's what's interesting. So when you when you build a character in the different games, the the points that you get for your attributes and your abilities, which is all you're just your human stuff is the same. So the only thing that makes them different is all the, the supernatural stuff. Mm. And, you know, like with vampire, you know, a beginning vampire, you're, you're way, way, way tougher than a human. You know, most things can't even kill you. The only things that can kill you are sunlight and fire. 
and you can you can use your blood to increase all of your physical attributes. So just in a fight, you're going to be better than any human. And plus, they can't kill you <laughs> unless they have sunlight or fire. Um, and you can heal really fast and, and stuff like that. And, and then like looking at a mage, it's like you're really not any better off against a vampire at the beginning because you need, I don't even remember what it is, but you need like two or three spheres to even be able to affect a vampire at all with your magic. I think you need, what is it, like spirit and matter? and I, I don't even remember. I think you need like three different spheres. Oh, no. So like I read into this because I wanted it done recently for obvious reasons. Um, all, all, all night folk, which are just not... Like any of the vampires, werewolves, all of these are just called night folk as far as mages are considered. Uh -huh. They all have just counterspelling is what, how, at least how it works in, in uh, the 20th edition. They have like a, a, a certain stat that just allows them to defend against magic. Okay, so yeah, so this is something I have to explain. See, this is a weird thing, okay? So yeah, and th this is actually what I wanted to ask you about. You, you just nailed it. So like the counterspell thing, each of the games has in like, like in D and D, what would be like your monster manual? Mm -hmm. Like for instance, mage will have, you know, here, here's an NPC for a vampire. Here's an NPC for a werewolf. If you want to throw them up against um, your player characters and they'll have the whole system, like what you're talking about, like, Oh, vampires have this much counterspell or whatever, but that's not actually the rules for if a player was playing a vampire. That's just an, an approximation using the mage rules. So that's so yes. that you can you can have a vampire adversary without having to go get the vampire books. It uses the systems in the mage rules. But it, it's when you actually cross the games Ooh. that yes. that the balance goes away. Because I think those are probably fairly balanced, at least for what that game wants. So so for instance. <laughs> We, we, we've had two fights in our mage game and the first one, I don't know, you know, how much you'd studied up at, on vampires at that point, but you didn't know about the counter spell thing. Nope. And that's like, that's when I was turning the vampires pants into steel and, and we were doing all this crazy stuff. And, you know, I, I assume you made the vampires tougher in some way you know, maybe you gave them more health levels or I don't know what exactly you did. I mean, it seemed like it was tougher than if we'd fought just humans, but we didn't have really any problem like using our magic on them. And then the second fight, you, you'd done some more homework yes. and, and it went from that to where like, we couldn't really affect them directly with a spell at all. And, um, it, yeah, it, it's funny, like to get into a little bit of the mechanics, but basically they just have a certain number of like, so how uh, all these games work is you you roll a number of d10s and you're looking for a certain number and that is how many successes. Yeah, and you need a certain number of successes to be effective. Um, generally, at least one or two. And so, um, but because of how m a lot of times you're going to have a pretty high dice pool to do many things. Like if you're firing a gun, you're going to maybe if you're decent with your gun, you probably have five, six, maybe seven dice to roll. Yeah, but with magic. You only like right now you have a tops of uh, character creation. You have a tops of three dice that you're rolling. Yeah. You only um, have two or three, depending on where you put your points. Exactly. Two or three dice. And so like you're getting one or two successes is if, unless you're spending a bunch of resources and things like that. One, two successes is pretty much the most you can hope for. So you know, uh, uh, they the night folk magic resistance is just like two dice. But that makes a huge difference yeah. because every success I have takes away one of yours, which means yeah. that it's all of a sudden like I get I have three dice that I'm rolling or two dice that I'm rolling and I need six plus your chances of getting a like a success or one or two. I get one success and all of a sudden you're down to nothing and yeah. uh, it goes away pretty quick. Um now, as you as you level up your your magic, it's going to get way like that one or two dice worth of uh, counter magic won't make as big of a difference. Right. right yeah. Now and, it does. and that's what I wanted to get into is, you know, it seems like for for mage, they they said, 
you know, we want these vampires where, you know, if you're, if you're a beginning mage with an Arate of two or three, which is how powerful your magic is, um, you're, you're not going to want to fight a vampire because chances are really good. Your magic either won't affect them because they have the same amount of dice to resist you as you have to do anything, right. or at best it'll have a small effect, but not much. Cause maybe you get two successes and they only get one or whatever. So you're going to want to avoid vampires, but then as you get more powerful, once you have, you know, Arate of four or five or six, now their two dice of counter magic don't matter that much because you have way more dice than that. So then you can kind of have your way with them once you get to a certain point. But if you were using, <laughs> like if you really wanted to be hard on yourself as a GM and you're like, I'm not going to use those rules. I'm going to actually use the vampire game. Then vampires don't have any counter magic of any kind, but instead it takes specific multiple spheres to affect them because they're not exactly alive and they're not exactly dead. So I think you need life and um, spirit and I think there's a third sphere, maybe matter, and you need them like you need life three, spirit three, matter two, or whatever it is. So it becomes instead of just, you know, until you have a certain level of power, you just can't affect them. It becomes like you can't affect them at all unless you happen to have these specific, specific spheres, which right. means maybe one person in the group can actually directly affect the vampire and the rest of the people can't. No matter, you know, they could have Arate eight, it doesn't matter. Right. And, and so what would be the problem? Because like if you're running mage, it, it doesn't matter. You just use their rules and everything's great. It doesn't matter. But where the problem would be was when GMs would try to run uh, in count, or a campaign where one of the players is playing a vampire and one of the players is playing a mage and one of the players is playing a werewolf, they would be like vastly different power levels. Yeah. Like, like starting out, the werewolf player would be like God and the vampire player would be like demigod, and the mage player would be like normal dude. <laughs> would also be there, <laughs> right? And then I think eventually that would end up like once you had a relatively powerful mage, like a relatively powerful mage who understands, like if they knew they needed to do something against a vampire or a werewolf, would have pretty much no problems doing so. Yeah, yeah. Once, right. as a mage, once you had the spheres you needed to affect a vampire, and once your Arate was high enough to succeed, like, at that point, it didn't really matter how powerful the vampire was anymore. You know, right. you, you could deal with all of them. <laughs> right. And you could also, you know, cool, I have Correspondence 4, so I'm going to affect the vampire from Spain. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, I don't care. You... I, I can do something every 10 seconds on your journey from where you are to Spain. Yes. <laughs> and we'll just keep on doing this. Like, yeah, there becomes a point where a mage just becomes, you know, a, almost a true god. Uh, yeah, mage and, very much to me feels like starting at zero level. Yes. Be, because yes. when you start out, especially, I mean, I raised my Arate to three, which mm -hmm. um, for people that don't know, when you make a character you get certain points to spend for certain things. And at the end you get these freebie points that you can use to increase anything you want, but different things cost different amount of freebie points. And Arate was like really expensive. I think it took like, I don't know. It felt like it took like half my freebie points just to get the one, the extra Arate. So you're definitely going to have players who don't like, they want other things. Like we, we, one of the characters only has a two, Right, it only has Rose's character only has two. Yeah, because she wanted to put points in other places, and she does, and she's very good at other things. But yeah, you know, it means that she's hurting, hurting on on her magic side for sure. But but to kind of put it in perspective, you know, you have usually when you make a role, you have an attribute plus an ability, and if you're talking something that your character is pretty good at, you probably have an attribute of like three or four, and you probably have an ability of beginning character maybe two or three so you're talking like you know what like five to seven dice you would have to yep. roll for that where your magic you have either two dice or three dice depending if you spend a bunch of your points on, on that arate so it's right. very compared to like like right now if i roll to hack something i have like 
I think seven or eight dice in my dice yeah. pool to hack something. But if I go to do magic, I only have three dice. Right. So you, you start very weak in that way. And then it's also interesting because it's, it's not like D and D where when you level up as a, as a mage, you just get more powerful and you can do more things. You, you kind of have to make a choice every time you spend XP do you want to get more powerful or do you want to be able to do more things? Cause those are two very different, you know, your power is just your arte. Like how many dice do you get to do magic? But then your spheres control what kind of magic you can actually do. So you have to choose, you know, do I want to be able to do more or do I want to be able to do what I can do better? Well, and what I liked about what we found out with mage is that it's, seems like it's hard to min max that magic right because you can't. if you're very if you put all of your points in one of the so there's nine different types of magic and it's basically how you blend those different types of magic together yeah. create the different types of spell effects that you can have um and so you know if you put all of your points into correspondence magic which is sort of teleporting and affecting things from a distance yeah right? affecting space you'd be very pardon <laughs> affecting space because uh, yeah, spheres affecting... all control like what aspects of reality you can manipulate right so corresponds and, you can manipulate space basically right and so if you put like all of your points into that and you're really really super high into that you could affect space really great but if you had nothing in life well you can't affect anybody who's alive Right. If you had nothing in matter, then you can't affect things. Right. If you had nothing in forces, you can't affect, you know, energy or anything like that. So, like, it's only by taking that and then mixing it with the other things that you're able to create the really interesting effects, which means that there's this sort of you want to be good at some you want to be very good at things, but you also want to be kind of mildly good at a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. And it. It, it means that there's a meaningful choice any time that you're spending XP to level anything, to, to increase anything in the game, which I like because I worried about that. Yeah, and all of the magic stuff is really expensive to oh, where if, if you're just going to like gain one new ability with your magic or, or improve one thing with your magic, you're talking probably at least three sessions worth of XP to, to do one little thing. Um, and with that XP, you could, you know, non-magic stuff, you could, you could have gotten quite a few things, like two or yes. three different things. Oh, um, for sure. And then, yeah, you have to decide, do I want to be able to do more different things or do I want to be better at what I can already do? So we've played, what, like six sessions, I think? Sessions, yep. And I, after six sessions, I earned enough XP to raise my Arate. And that's the, like, I haven't spent XP on anything. I think you're out now. Yeah, so so I'll now, from now on, I'll have four dice for my magic instead of three, which still is not approaching like any mundane thing I might do that I'm good at. But it it's uh, a lot better than three dice. Hey, that extra die makes a big difference. But I, I still can't teleport another person. Because like with correspondence nope. all by itself, you can teleport yourself. But in order to bring someone with me, I need, I think, life two. Yep, or you need three. life too. Yeah, and I only have, I don't have any life, actually, so... Right, so that would cost you... Well, that would cost you 20-some XP? Or no, 18? it cost you 18 XP or something. Because I think it's like, 10 for a new sphere, and then current and then rating times 8, if times it's not eight. your So yeah, it affinity. costs you 18, and like yeah. to put it in perspective, you only get 3 to 5 XP per session? Yeah, right. I feel, I think most sessions I've gotten... Three or four. Yeah. I think so, you could get up to five if you really... Yeah, if you get everything. If everything's sort of lined up in a row, I think you'd get to five. But that, but yeah, three to four is probably pretty common. So if you think that it costs 18 to do yeah. one thing, that's... That's know, at least six sessions. Maybe, five or six sessions, Five or probably. six sessions, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's story XP and there's other things in yeah. there as well, but... And, and all the... Fine. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, in, in, in some ways, it's a good thing because... I don't know. I like 
as we were talking about my Thursday group that play multi-year campaigns all the time, that's the concept that I have when I go into a game is that like, for the most part, if we're going into something, I like the idea of like being able to really get into it and yeah. really explore this world and the stories and the characters. And so if the game like ramps up way too quick and it's like, yeah. cool, there's only 10 sessions worth of play in here, then, you know, it's good to know that going in, I guess is probably that. Cause I've had plenty of games that I've played that are that, it's just something that you want to know that's happening before you play. Like the 13th age campaign that I ran had this problem where I, the game was longer than uh, the campaign was longer than the leveling. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, like people leveled up pretty quick. And then I was like, Oh, and then I had to do some like forced, like slowing down of XP. And it meant that people went like a really long time before they leveled up yeah. because there was too much story. Well, these games, um, the leveling, if you go just by the book, as far as what they suggest you give XP for, um, the leveling is is quite slow. And Mage is by far the slowest. For instance, well, your you know attributes, abilities, those like all the normal abilities are the same in all the games. But for instance, in Vampire, you have your disciplines, which are your magic powers, basically. And you have a clan discipline and then all the others. And so what is it mage to, to raise a sphere is times eight. And yeah, if it's times seven for your times seven sphere. for your affinity, well, vampire, your uh, clan discipline is times five and all the other disciplines are times seven. So okay. it's just across the board cheaper. Right. And, and also like mage, you're also having to raise your arate, which is times eight. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and goes so up to have, ten. <laughs> you have these like multiple taxes that sort yeah. of go on here. Um, but if you think about what a sphere difference, like the difference between a like you know times time the time sphere, because yeah. time travel is a magic thing. By the way, yeah. don't even get me on what GMing time travel is like. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, cause that's funny. Um, but like d the difference between like a time three and time four is, or even times two time to time three is insane. Like yeah. what the, the, the play space that that opens up comparative to, and I did go through and look at the bunch of the vampire, well, not a bunch, but a few of the vampire things when I made the characters that we did the, from the last fight is I said, okay, well let's go into vampire and actually pick some disciplines that are there yeah and i was like oh okay yeah and that was when you had described that like the disciplines in vampire are much more described it's like yes they are much more described it's like yes. cool you now have dark vision it's it allows very you to specific. see in the dark yeah right and it's like oh okay versus you can now affect time on other people oh what yeah does like, that mean? <laughs> yeah it definitely makes sense why spheres cost more than disciplines because you can you know with mind one you can do a lot more than you can with like Auspex one. And, and they're kind of similar as far as what they, what they give you. But the, the mage, you're getting a lot more that you can do with that thing that you just got. For sure. For sure. But yes. Yeah, it, it definitely like makes sense that it's that way. But, you know, the, the end result is as a, as a mage character, more so than the other games, you feel kind of like, like you're really at the beginning of yeah. your journey with magic. Like when you start out, you, you can't do a whole lot, you know, and you maybe have one kind of area that you're a little better at and you can do a little more with, but you're still, there's not a whole lot you can do, but then it just, it's like each thing that you get, it's almost like an exponential increase in what you can do now. But you know, though, but when you say it's funny because you say that you can't do much, but I'm looking at things where like, you know, you wanted to, you needed to find out the or figure out where that laptop was and you didn't know where she was and you didn't know where any like, you know, you wanted to try to steal the laptop. Well, you did it, you're, you're, the party did it two ways. One went back in time and knocked it out of the van when it was being stolen at a time like a week ago. Yeah. And and then that was something that you were able to do. And then you just reached through time and space and plunked it off of the <laughs> desk that she was working on. Yeah. Right. Like you just created a bubble, a hole in space and went yoink. So yeah. when you think about like what if, if I gave you if I gave like a level one 
wizard in D&D the ability to do anything of like what you can do in mage that like you're doing more as a level like a starting mage than a lot of like level 20 wizards would be able to do because you have the freedom to be able to yeah definitely do whatever you need to or to a certain degree right with constraints yeah i was i was talking compared to the other supernaturals in world of darkness oh, but but yeah compared enough. to like a dnd mate yeah a beginning mage in a way is more powerful than like a 20th level dnd wizard because you you're not limited to specific spells of what you can right. do even still like what your ability to do both of those things like there's no wizard or there's no ma- vampire that can travel time right right and there's no vampire that can teleport through space as far as i'm aware yeah so you know what you're able to do and i, I think when you're talked about when you said like going against a vampire ma- uh, what you should be doing is mages at this level is having a goal getting the goal accomplished and then getting the heck out of dodge yeah. right like you are going to die to the vampire as soon as the vampire has a chance to be able to do so yeah so a lot of what you did was avoid having the chance to do so and and that's where i ended up in our last session is we were going against these new and improved vampires with counter spell and <laughs> that you know it was just, it was not 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 only was it not going our way but I didn't see the potential of, you know, we get a lucky roll and suddenly things are going our way. Like, like it looked like it was just on the downward spiral. And so I was like, you know, we're here to rescue this girl. Let's get the girl. Let's get the hell out of here. Um, yeah. And then luckily for us, because I mean, I think her, her and I had a pretty good chance of escaping, but I was kind of leaving everybody else. You know, I was like... The, you guys are on your own. I'm out of here. And, you know, luckily at that point, the other characters got got creative with their magic and, and were able to kind of actually did turn things around. I still don't think if we would have like stuck it out that we would have like killed all the vampires before they killed us. But um, we what did we kill one of them or two yep. of them? One of them. So we now we've one. killed two total in the campaign. Two, two fights. And yep. uh, two fights, two vampires down. And yeah. Both of those fights, you had one of your characters nearly die. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it, you're right. Um, like, and that's sort of bring it back. The goal of this, when you go into a D&D encounter, your goal is to sort of kill the bad guys. Because to bring it all the way back to the beginning of the conversation, that's where you get XP. You get right. XP from killing those bad guys. And like, there's arguments to be made that like, as long as you beat the encounter, you right. get the XP from it. But. I think most of the time uh, you'd have to have a pretty friendly GM who says, I run into the room, I steal the magical thing and then run away and I want full XP for all the right. monsters in yeah. there. <laughs> right? Even like, even I would probably not give you full XP. I might give you half, but I wouldn't yeah. give you... Because I'm like, did you really defeat it though? You just avoided it. <laughs> <laughs> right, like the rogue... You know, gets invisibility cast on them and they sneak, 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 yeah. yoink, sneak, sneak, and then run away. And it's like, okay, I don't know if I'm giving you XP. Uh, I'll yeah. give you something. <laughs> you know, like, that, oh. That's a great point, Craig. Um, this game mage is basically, you know, all those times in other games where you break the game and it's a bad thing. Like, that's what this game's all about. Like, that's how you win is you have to break the game. <laughs> <laughs> and otherwise you're going to lose because... You know, you have your magic, but in every other way, you're just a normal human. And and compared with any of the other supernaturals in the world, like you're no match for them. The 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 only thing that's special about you is this magic, and and that's all how you use it. And that's not right. even really powerful unless you figure out how to make it powerful. And uh, that also doesn't include the thing that actually grabbed me about the magic system, which is this concept of paradox and vulgar versus coincidental, right? Like the world doesn't believe in magic. Therefore, if you do something that like, you can't throw a fireball down main street. Well, you can, (laughs) but the world's going to notice and they're going to hit you back and it's going to hit you back hard. And so like you have to, you not only have the creativity of how you want to create your magic, but then you have this sort of added layer of creativity of, how can I make it so that seems plausible? 
Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because you're, as as you know, when we when we racked you up with a whole bunch of paradox points for casting a whole whole lot of very obvious magic, teleporting around, magic, <laughs> you you exploded in the middle of a vampire fight. Yeah. 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 And you you luckily came away from that without any without any damage, but uh, that's not necessarily the case. Right. So you know. Yeah. Yeah, and it's sort of this entertaining thing to say the very least. Yeah, and that's one thing really cool about the the World of Darkness games is that the, like a lot of other games don't have is your character has conflict built into your character, like just within yourself. So like Mage, it's the whole paradox thing. Um, like Vampire, you have your humanity where the more horrible things you do, you like lose your morality, basically. And and the more you lose that, the less control you have over yourself when the beast takes over. Um, right. So they all all their games have something like that where, you know, like D&D, your character just always gets more powerful unless you get killed, right? But unless you get killed, you gain levels, you get more and more powerful. But these games, there's this, each game has this like mechanism, like Mage's Paradox, where it's like, no, it's not just the, you always get more powerful there. You also have to deal with paradox and, you know, no matter how badass you are, it can always come in and get you. <laughs> right. So for like the listeners at home, just to make sure, uh, so paradox is basically the sort of, so magic needs to be sort of explained away. Otherwise the world sort of says no. And the way that that mechanically works is you gain this thing called paradox. And it's basically this, it's a pool that sort of accumulates on your character. And narratively, it's this idea of your sort of almost like bad karma is almost a way of yeah. sort of describing it. And it gets built up and built up and built up. And then at some point, the GM says, well, we're going to roll a paradox roll. And he or, or they uh, take however many paradox points you have, roll that many D10s. And if and the more successes that end up happening, the worse uh, the paradox is going to happen. And there's an, a bunch of different effects that can happen, but it can go all the way up to including your character going quiet, which basically means you just lose all access to magic. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, and that's the cost of doing your of of, ex, of exploring that side of your character in the same way that there's the similar things that are happening in, in Vampire and Werewolf and all the rest of them. Yeah. Like that's one of the things that like 5e when it brought in the warlock. I thought the warlock was a cool class because it has sort of a built-in story hook into it, like yes. that your 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 patron or your whatever it was. Yeah. Like the there's a story that's sort of built into there. Right. Right. Yeah. Like when I joked earlier about like nobody asks why the fighter's good with a sword. Well, people actually did ask why the warlock's good with what they're doing, right? right. There's yeah. that pact that they've made. There's that deal that they're they're working through. And I guess the cleric has always sort of had that sort of built into them as well. Um, but the warlock just felt juicier. There felt like there was more of a conflict that's going through right. there exactly. where the cleric ends up being like, you know, that God's my, he's my guy. Yeah. And that was as long as you didn't, you know, do anything to tick that one off. And generally, you most players didn't you know actively tick off their gods so it was usually okay but it feels like you know a warlock character has a patron seems to have their own goals and their own machinations which is kind of interesting in the same way as in mage uh every mage has an avatar which is their sort of like awakened part of their soul which this sort of other part of them of that's built within the mage that is a actual thing that has a different degree of power, a different degree of autonomy and things like that. But there's that built in like character flaw. There's that built in conflict that is interesting in there. And it starts right from the very beginning. And yeah. I think it's just because the game is much more focused on the role playing side of it. It's much more focused on uh, the narrative side of things and figuring out how to do that. It's also more like mystery focused, which is kind of interesting. Right. Like when I when you when we go back to talking about what I did to prep, the big thing I had to do to prep for this game was figure out what the mystery was. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, a D&D &D generally has a quest. You have to go and get the MacGuffin. 
right? And uh, most of the time, and even the best written adventures and most of the ones that I've ever played, it's hard to do like a good central mystery that uh, because it's like there's there's not a whole lot of tools that every player has to be able to uncover those mysteries. And you need to if you have it's, it's really tough to write something in your traditional fantasy thing that's going to allow every player to feel like they're involved in uncovering that. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, you have the character who has really good investigation. Cool. They get to do the mystery part. Yeah, totally. They make all the roles. <laughs> right. And it's like, OK, well, what do we do with that then? Well, you know, it's cool that you bring that up because when I resurrected this show from the, the year hiatus, if I remember right, the, the first episode I did was comparing problem solving or mystery solving to combat. And and I was talking about our Numenera game that we were playing, um, which, you know, I came, I hadn't GM'd for quite a while. I hadn't played for quite a while. And we started this Numenera game and the adventure we were playing, it was very much like one mystery after another for the players to solve. And I just, at some point while we were playing that, it just hit me. I'm like, you know what? This is more fun for me. And it seems like it's more fun for the players than just another combat, like the whole solving a mystery thing, figuring out what's going on. Um, So yeah, I think that's, that's like really important for a good game is to have some, some mystery to, to figure out. Yeah. Well, I hope you're enjoying it. Like, what I did is I simply said, okay, well, I'll, you know, not to give away too much because I have a player in the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but, you know, it, basically what I did is I figured out like a mystery and I said, cool, I'm just going to do two more and I'm going to have them interconnect slightly over go. different ways because that way they're not red herrings. They just simply put you towards another mystery. That's awesome. In my way, a red herring is fine, but like a dead end sucks. Yeah. So yeah. I'm like, cool, well, we'll just make loops. Yeah. Everywhere you go just brings you back to somewhere else. And so that was, uh, I think it was sort of a Jason Alexander from the uh, the Alexandrian gave me those concepts back in the day. Oh, yeah. Um, which should be required reading for every GM. I agree. Yeah, there's a lot of good <laughs> stuff on that, on that blog. Um, but yeah, that was how that worked because it is more fun to figure out something. And and it's more fun from a from a GM point of view because you don't know where people are going to be going. You don't really know what's going to happen. Um, you know, there's a reason why these games are fun to GM, and I think my reason that I enjoy doing these is because you get to like create the start, and then you just see how where it goes from there, right? Like if if everything played out exactly as how I had it written in my notes, it would be very boring. <laughs> <laughs> We, you know, another thing that's nice about, you know, characters having their own conflict, like built into them, like these characters do, is it, it does give you something to do if you're in a situation where like only one player can show up, where a lot of times that just be, okay, we're not going to play. But these games, I mean, they, they start you off suggesting to do a prelude, which is where you get together with each player individually and kind of do a little one off with them. But it also, you know, it makes it really easy to do solo stuff, you know, because right. it, we all have our our relationship with um, with our avatars and with our paradox, and um, in, in fact, when you when you raise your arate, you basically are encouraged to you know do a thing with the GM like a like a vision quest kind of thing. <laughs> Like a, yeah, like this magical journey that you go on during which you gain some new understanding that reflects, you know, your arate going up. And and that's really cool. Like, you know, we did that with our Primordia game. You know, I did vignettes with some of you guys, but there wasn't anything in the game itself, like within the system or within your characters that suggested we do that or demanded we do that. It was just something we we did but um these ideas yeah these these games like it's built in you know as a gm it won't be hard to come up with something to do with a single player if if you want to uh no well and hopefully it's not um (laughs) no i think the vignettes actually that would be sort of if i had to go back and talk to uh past craig i would do those preludes um because i 
as, as somebody who came brand new into the system and I was sort of like, well, I'm going to figure out what I need to do. And I didn't do those, uh, those, those individual character preloads. And uh, part of the reason for that, I will say, was a bit of, I don't know, intimidation because I didn't really know how the system was working. Yeah. I didn't really know what was going to be happening. I didn't like there wasn't a whole lot of understanding. So I said, well, maybe if we all jump in together into the deep end, our, yeah, we'll, we'll be fine. Right. Like <laughs> somebody will know how to swim and we'll make it work out. And so the risk on that of just I very rarely go into a game that I haven't played and GM it because that's a little bit. Yeah, like, I don't know, extreme GMing or something. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, you definitely and, jumped into the deep end for sure. And so I that that was where I avoided the prelude because of those reasons. But if knowing now what I know, and it's only been like six sessions, but uh, I think those preludes do a really great job of um, allowing the players and the GM to sort of understand a little bit about their characters and sort of get into the get into the mindset of playing that character in a really safe space. Yeah. Cause they can do it alone, like not alone with the GM, but they don't have to worry about other players and the judgment's really low and you can sort of do what, what, what you need to. And it's more of like a self exploration yeah. um, session, yeah. which is great. And so we didn't do those for the reasons. And now I'm sort of what I'm doing instead is uh, we're going to do the, uh, the, the, the Lex vignette TM. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um then we're gonna do that whenever you raise uh Arate. yeah and uh and so those will allow for those individual solo sessions where people can really sort of understand and learn something about themselves as a character without having to worry about sharing spotlight as well i think yeah. that's another important part of what a vignette allows you to do or what those preludes allow you to do is you you're able to steal the spotlight yeah because there's nowhere else for it to go yeah well, I, I know in, in our D and D game, like all the vignettes I did with all you guys were always so much fun. And yeah, that's a big part of it is you don't have to share the spotlight with three or four other people. You get to hog it all for yourself and And not feel bad about that. <laughs> yeah. And and that's when yeah. you can really kind of build up your character and build up their past and, and stuff like that. And Yeah, which is great. So there you are. There's a product that you'd be selling on uh, the DM <laughs> Guild. Yeah, right. How to how to make vignettes? How to run vignettes? D and D's missing. Did, have we uh, have we covered everything? I feel like we have. In the two and a half hour conversation yeah, right? we just had, <laughs> I think you have a lot of editing in front of you. Oh yeah, it's always fun. <laughs> All right. Well, that's going to wrap it up today for episode 292. Thanks again to Craig for joining me uh, for this, these couple episodes. Uh, if you have any feedback or questions you'd like to send my way, you can email me at gamemastersjourney at gmail.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Lex Starwalker, and you can call my voicemail 951-GMJ-LEX-1. That's 951-465-5391. Please join us on our community on Discord. You can find a link to our Discord community in the show notes at lexstarwalker.com slash GMJ. So thank you so much for tuning in for another episode. And uh, yeah, hopefully uh, be coming back uh, soon with yet another episode of Game Master's Journey. And until then, game on. This has been a Starwalker Studios production, your source for quality gaming and hobby podcasts. This episode's music, courtesy of Cloudwalker, Transboy, Renfield, Stanko, and Ish. See the show notes for more details at starwalkerstudios.com slash Game Master's Journey.